you start your your tweet thread talking about this uh, this question. You introduce this question. Do you believe that you have to lend money to a real estate billionaire at below market rates to buy a coffee? What, what is this question doing? What, what's the function of, of this question? What's its role here? So two parts. One, a good way to get people's attention and get them to listen as opposed to coming with preconceived notions is ask them an unexpected question, mm. right? Because they start trying to answer it for themselves or start trying to figure out, you know, exactly as you're doing now, like, why did you ask that question? So the rhetorical technique of start with an unexpected question that's thought provoking is one that you will find a lot of educators mm. use in general, mm. right? Like my class on stable coins at one point, I started with, why do you guys have a bank account? Like, don't answer me right away. Take 30 seconds. Think about it. Write it down. Why do you have a bank account? Right. And just asking people these kinds of questions, I think, creates a different mental space than if you begin, you know, with a statement or an assault on like certain beliefs. Two, inherent in that particular question is a sense of fairness. Right. Like if you understand the mechanics of what is really going on with the modern banking plus payment system, which we've stapled together, there are some inherent issues of fairness there that are accessible to the average person where they don't need all of the background of crypto to understand that, wait, why do I have to lend money to a real estate billionaire to buy a coffee? Right. Like that seems weird. Right. There's just something fundamentally unnatural about that arrangement. And before you even get to crypto, if you have somebody agreeing with you that, wait a minute, okay, this does feel kind of funny, then you can start discussing why certain things might be solutions to those sorts of problems. I think maybe some people listening to this are like, wait, so uh, when I'm buying my coffee, well, how am I also lending money to a real estate agent? Can you connect those two things? Yeah, absolutely. Um, specifically, uh, real estate builder more than the agents. So mm. let's think about what I'm going to call the conception of a bank that people have in their head and then what banks actually do in reality. So in your head, the simple model that most people have of a bank is you go to the bank, you give them money, like let's literally do the caricature of like you show up in person and you hand them dollar bills. And people somehow have in their head that the thing the bank does is like takes those dollar bills, goes into the back and like throws them in a vault. And I am here to tell you that if you think the banking system works that way, boy, are you wrong. <laughs> and two... Right. So the next step out from that is, well, obviously they do something with the money, but like the thing they do nowadays is mostly making loans. And if you look at bank balance sheets, it is not like call it home lending to the average person that remains on a bank's balance sheet. Those things are called agency mortgages. They get packaged up into securitizations and sold into the market. Banks do a little bit of risk retention, but if you look at major bank balance sheets, it's not like super majority agency mortgages. They're going to have riskier stuff on there. You're going to see like credit card loans, small business loans, private student loans, like commercial real estate, large scale residential real estate, like jumbo loans, et cetera, and even more exotic stuff like trade finance, and, you know, all of those sorts of things. And I want to be clear, many of those things do have legitimate economic purposes to them. I am not here to criticize lending or banking. I think that's a mistake. What I am here to criticize is that the way we've created our current system, it becomes mandatory for you to participate in those activities just to use the system for payments because we've kind of given banks a monopoly on the payment system in the United States, right? So there are many places in the world and many times throughout history where banking and payments were not synonymous. But here, because of how we regulate the banks, like when you pay for something with a debit card or with a credit card, ultimately that's going back to your bank balances. And what's that bank doing with your bank balances? lending money to a like real estate billionaire to build stuff. So there's essentially, unless you want to be all cash, right? Like physical cash, no way out of this problem in the United States using electronic payments. Okay. And I think the punchline that I think we really want to, to land here is that the expectations of your average Joe uh, buying a coffee or, you know, mom going, dropping the kids off at school, stopping at Starbucks, is that their money in the bank is safe. Uh, it's ready for them whenever they want it. Uh, there's there's no risk to them, you know, going and retrieving their money. Uh, and what you're what you're alluding to is that for banking to work at all, 
there's actually some social contract of depositors that there's risk uh, behind on the other side of the trade. But there's a gap there. The users of banks, the customers of banks, assume on a on a on just a systemic level that there's no risk. But systemically, there has to be risk because that's how the banks operate. And that's kind of like the gap that I think uh, has led to things like perhaps the 2008 crisis. But also, uh, I think also you're kind of when you ask this question, uh, do you believe that you should have to lend money at a real estate billionaire at below market rate to buy coffee? You're kind of exposing that gap. That's really the gap that you're kind of like uh, allowing to come to the surface. Well, I think there's two levels to that gap. Um, one is exactly what you just said. And I, I think that's a pretty fair summarization. And the other one, right, as I would put it here, is an incentive problem of the way we've designed the system where banks essentially, because they have this sort of monopoly, can pay depositors zero on their checking accounts, are also taking essentially a large amount of money that could in theory be allocated to people using the system for payments and instead giving it to the borrowers, right? Like put differently, the systemic like design of our system gives a large subsidy to people using the system for borrowing versus people using the system for payments. Because if I step back and say, I don't want to lend money to anybody other than the U.S. government, I totally want to use this only for payments, I should be able to basically be like, I want to get paid the risk-free rate minus a fee on my deposits, spend them as I see fit, and like that's the entirety of my activity, okay, bye. And by the way, guys, the risk-free rate as of the time of like, you know, recording this podcast is about 5%. Go look at what you're getting paid on your checking account. I guarantee you it is much lower than that. Mm -hmm. That piece to me starts to resonate with the the normie. One um, issue I I, uh, wonder if you have at this point in the conversation, Austin, is like a lot of people aren't finance uh, uh, minded. And so we need to start talking about things like risk-free rate and you start talking about like basically how the banking system works. And um, you, you find yourself like going, harkening back to, to mental models like, oh, fractional reserve. And then it, now you have to explain that. And like the normie, again, they don't think this way. They're not a finance brain. They're not a, a finance professor at Columbia, you know, hundreds of hours of the Bankless podcast. So they start to tune out and they're a little bit like, Austin, I don't need to know how it all works. I don't care how the sausage is made. I use my computer. I don't need to know what a motherboard is or how the internet works in order to use my computer. I just use my computer. And when I show up at the bank and I go and I try to withdraw a thousand dollars, they let me have it. So it kind of seems like it's there. And yeah, I understand that there's some risks and I understand that the bankers kind of take a cut on the system and it's sort of lopsided and unfair and like billionaires are sort of, you know, managing the strings and they have some notion of that. But like, I don't need to know all the details of how it works because when I show up at the bank, I get my money. And even when there's crisis scenarios, and by the way, this goes back to generations. I don't know anyone in, you know, living memory. My parents have always been able to go to the bank and get their money out. And uh, their grandparents like mostly have too. And like, there's some ancient stuff from like, you know, Movies like It's a Wonderful Life where there's runs on the bank, but that doesn't happen anymore, right? We've got that figured out. So like, why does this matter to me? You're saying there's risk, but like, I don't feel or experience any of the risk. And so I could just ignore it. I ignore a lot of things in you know, like complexity in life. And why not ignore banking complexity too? Yeah, no, exactly what you have just summarized is why Jamie Dimon is a billionaire and you're not. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so what what you're talking about fundamentally is two different things. One is opportunity cost is not something that people are good at measuring in their head. So the way I tend to summarize that question talking with normies is, okay, cool. So why do you think it's okay for a bank to pay you zero and then just go hand the money to the Federal Reserve and get paid 5% with no risk? Like, is 5% per year a fair price to manage all your money? Right. Question number one, right? Let's just have that discussion. Question number two that I ask people is, so have you uh, seen the movie Office Space, Mm -hmm. right? To which most people, thankfully, have seen that movie. The trick of the banking system is essentially what the guys at Office Space were doing, which is they're shaving pennies off of every (laughs) transaction that you're doing, and it feels small, but adds up to a giant number over time. So what you've got to understand is the system is going to charge you over a 10-year period like $100,000 to use it, But they're never just going to charge you $100,000 because you'd lose your mind. They're going to charge you $1 100,000 times. And that's why it's invisible. And essentially, you're being screwed. 
And the fact that you don't know it is exactly what they're relying upon. What about this risk piece? So being screwed, okay, I accept that part yes. of the argument. What about this risk piece? So I put my money in the bank. It, it's safe, right? I have FDIC insurance. There's, they got the logo there. I've seen this. Yeah. And so my answer to that with people is, realistically, if you have under $250,000 in a U.S. bank, you are actually probably safe ignoring the issue of timing so long as the U.S. financial system continues to function. Like the FDIC is not infinite. It can totally get wiped out at some point. We will have much bigger problems if that happens. See like the fears in 2008. But the bigger problem is, and this is one of the great sins of finance in general, is starting with your personal situation and assuming that applies to the system. So I tell this story to people who have doubts about that. I have a personal friend. I'm not going to say which of the banks that failed that he banked with, but he banked with one of the banks that failed in that whole spate of bank failures, you know, of all the S named banks failing. And he ran a grocery store. Okay. And so here's the problem that he has his net profit margin. So that is if I sell a hundred dollars of stuff, he makes about a buck 50, right? So 1.5% is a net profit margin for a grocery store. Almost every day of the week, he has more than $250,000 in his bank account just because turnover and volume. Because people are buying like tomatoes and butter and bread and milk, like things that we all kind of take for granted. And a business at any scale very quickly breaches your $250,000 FDIC limit. And this whole argument of, well, why do you keep more than $250,000 in the bank works very well at the individual level and works terribly even at the small corporate level. Because what you're really asking this guy is, yo, why are you selling people groceries, right? Which I think all of us believe that selling groceries is probably a social good. I would prefer people have food than not. But once you understand that the problem is not on your end, it's probably on the small businesses end and actually know they might not get all their money back. Like to think the banking system is safe for them is crazy because issue number one is once you're over that limit, are you going to get your uninsured deposits back? But issue number two is just, are you even going to get them in a timely fashion? Mm. Like that guy's got to pay his employees. He's got to pay his vendors. He's got to pay his rent. He's got to pay his electricity bill. And so if the money is like frozen for three to six months in some bank resolution, that can bankrupt him just as easily as not having it at all. And so I would tell you the area in which our system is the most unfair and the fact that it's this is part of why it's persisted this way is probably small to medium corporates and individuals of call it medium high net worth, right? Because they don't have an easy way out. Like you're not yet to, I have $25 million in my own private banker at UBS levels of rich, but you're also not, I can easily stay below $250,000 in a single bank. Mm -hmm. And so it simplifies, Ryan, to, okay, so you're cool as long as you keep your money, but you don't care if the grocery store goes bankrupt. So the structure really that comes out of this system is that you have, you know, millions, tens of millions of, you know, bank users with, you know, their, their savings, they're below $250,000 savings in a bank and banks is taking the aggregate amount of user deposits and making like in investments. They're making risky, maybe not that risky, but risk is present investments in choices that they are making. And the, the scale of the financial system is like built on this structure, which really begs the question who is doing their risk management because a small number of people are making very large choices for the rest of us and for the structure that is built on top of this banking system. So who is doing their risk management and how, how does that work? Yeah. So one, the answer to who is doing the risk management is when you look at banks, it's this complicated chain of what are called first line people, which are going to be all the people like making loans or like, for instance, I was one of those people at JP Morgan and City. Like I was a trader in global rates in both places, making decisions day in and day out about where to allocate the bank's money, doing things that ranged from, in my opinion, pretty non-risky to sometimes hilariously risky, if we're being honest with each other about how like markets works. Um, though hopefully if it's hilariously risky, not in large size, because one way you keep yourself alive doing that is small positions. And so they're making the first decisions. The second set of decisions come from all of the people who are supposed to be controlling them. So your risk officers, like market market risk, credit risk, like treasury management, all of those people who are supposed to be keeping the lights on and making good decisions there. You have a third line behind that risk, which is audit. And then behind them, you have the regulators. 
But the problem with this system, even with all of those multiple layers, is all of it relies fundamentally on these people making good decisions. And number one, transparently, they often do not make good decisions. Otherwise, banks would not fail. But we have seen plenty of bank failures. And number two, it's not really possible to police that from the outside, right? Because, you know, back to the FDIC discussion, the other thing you often hear from people is, well, just make sure that your bank is safe. And like, how? Like somebody explained to me how to do that with your hands if you are not like a psychopathic fixed income trader trading like a bank capital book at a bank. Like I did that professionally for a decade at JP Morgan. And I'll tell you right now, you know, and I said this in my tweet thread, I don't think I had a 100% handle on the capital position of all of the banks that I was trading with, right? And I'm like a professional doing this 80 to 100 hours a week and thinking about this constantly. The idea that my friend running the grocery store should, oh, by the way, go get an MBA and become a bank capital expert just to have a bank account, to me is like ludicrous on the face. To continue leveling up your crypto game, then you need to get on the Bankless newsletter. It's the world's most popular crypto email and is completely free. Just click below to sign up.